After Jesus' death, the people who had lived, loved, and worked with Jesus faced the challenge of recreating their community now that Jesus was gone. So with fear, hope, and divergent opinions about what they should do, those whom Jesus left behind began to struggle with what it meant to be recalled to life. Jesus had led them so ably, but it now meant they had to determine their next steps, and they had to decide how they would become followers of the Christ. In these weeks of Easter tide, in these days between Easter and Pentecost, we are working with the idea of being recalled to life. We're doing this through the lens of many of the people who experienced the life and the death of Jesus. In the days and weeks after his death, they had to find a way to go on. After the loss of someone so very dear to them. They had gone through a didn't see it coming moment. They all had hoped that the years with Jesus were just a beginning. They knew the transformation that had come from his teaching and from the way he lived his life. There was an intimacy that grew with every step along the way. So those who were close to Jesus during his lifetime, and especially those who walked with him during the last three years of his life, became like family. In this group, there were siblings of Jesus and, of course, his mother, but there were also people who were part of a chosen family. And it is this chosen family that we know the most about. Granted, there were some real characters in this family. A few of them are sort of like your crazy great uncle Harry. Peter, after all, in today's narrative, was naked, fishing on a boat in the middle of the night. But thankfully, Peter put on some clothes before he jumped in the water. That makes a lot of sense. So this narrative today shows how much Jesus cared for his chosen family. My heart tells me it was so hard for him to leave them. Yet he had devoted so much of his being to them that his presence stayed with them long after he was gone. One of the reasons I love our story today is, as my husband can tell you, Breakfast is absolutely my favorite meal. I can eat breakfast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I am the most happy when we end up in a restaurant that serves breakfast all day long. Some of my fondest memories as a child are about breakfast and fish, vacation, and fires. When we traveled, my father was always on the lookout for just the right stream where we could pull off the road and fish. He was an avid fisherman, and he wanted me to be an av avid fisherwoman. He had waders made for me when I was about eight or nine years old. You can't buy waders like that, or you couldn't then, so they were special made so that I could fish right along with him. And while we were fishing, my mother and sister would build a fire and they would get out the grate and the cast iron skillet from the car. For years, I thought everybody carried a cast iron skillet in their trunk, just in case, you know? So my dad caught the fish, I caught the fish, my mother and sister cooked the fish. Through the years, I have eaten a lot of trout. I love trout. But even in the finest restaurants prepared by the greatest chefs, trout has never tasted as good as it did on those sweet days. There was an intimacy about those meals that has held my heart, though it has been so many years since my parents died. And while there was no sermon preached around that fire, they were teaching us a priceless lesson about food and family and love and care. 
Each time I read this passage in the Gospel of John again, I realize that the sacrament of the Eucharist, the communion table that we will share today, is a continuation of the love and care Jesus had for his friends and a reminder of all the meals we have shared with people who loved us, people who cared for us. In this place, the table is a sign of our continued love and care for each other. Somewhere along the way, all of us have realized that life is too hard to do it alone. We need a village to surround us and to walk with us through all the days of our journeys. That's why First Church is so important, not only for those of us who come here week after week, but also for those who need our lives to make a difference in their lives. The LA Times reported yesterday that Los Angeles officials are bracing for the release of a report that will likely show little or no progress in reigning in homelessness. Even though $619 million were spent last year. Yesterday, we hosted an event for Imagine LA. Imagine LA is one of our new partners. It's a wonderful nonprofit that works with families that are coming out of homelessness. These families are matched with mentors who become their extended family as these individuals are being recalled to life. I had the opportunity to hear just a few of their stories as many of them graduated from the program that was held on our forecourt. There were only brief details about their lives before they were able to move into permanent housing. But the stories of what they have accomplished in the last few years was very revealing. Revealing in large part because they helped me realize just getting off the street and into a house or an apartment isn't the total answer. I was reminded yesterday that it takes a village to help people believe in themselves again. State Senator Maria Elena DeRazo was the key speaker at the event. This was the first time I had heard her speak, and she is incredible. She told part of her story, and I found myself tearfully listening as she spoke of a woman she knew from the daycare her child was in years ago. Long before she was Sen Senator DeRazo, she managed to get a college education, and then she began to dream about going to law school. She shared that dream with the woman at the daycare, and that she didn't think it would be possible to go to law school because of her young son. The program that worked for her was four nights a week for four years. Without hesitation, the woman said to her, I will take care of your son. And Senator DeRazo asked, four weeks a night for four years? And the woman said, four weeks a night for four years. A chosen family, a village helped raise her child and gave us a woman who is changing lives every single day. She has been tireless in her support of women and families. And she reminded us that we do the most good for the most people when we empower them to do it for themselves. The presence of Jesus with the disciples in the days and weeks following his death had a very distinct purpose, I believe. Jesus wanted them to remember that he had empowered them to do the most good for the most people. It started with the small village of people they had created. It began with meals around tables, tables where there was bread and fruit of the vine and probably some fish. 
And as time went on, their tables grew and multiplied so that people all over the world could find a table with a place set for them. Ever since I arrived at First Church, I have dreamed of hosting a dinner here in the sanctuary. I'm going to hope Susan Leary, our CAO, is not listening at this moment. I have this dream of a really long table that goes straight up the center aisle and another table that goes all the way across the front of the chancel. I dream that this table will remind us that even though we are so diverse, we all belong at this table. I would love for it to symbolize that diversity is our strength. I believe it would remind us that for this church to become all it has been called to be will require everyone in our village to do their part. This dream will require our time, our money, our talents, all of our gifts. And most of all, it will require our open and generous hearts. The scripture Helena read today is the final story of the four canonical gospels. In this story, Jesus shows us what it means to be the embodiment of love in the world. In this story, Jesus shows us what grace and forgiveness truly mean. In this story, Jesus shows us what the gospel, the good news, really is. And in this story, Jesus directs us to how we are to live in relationship to one another not through an eloquent sermon or even an amazing miracle. Now Jesus did it in the simple act of lighting a fire and cooking breakfast. As we look to our future, as we are being recalled to life in the city of angels, the formula isn't terribly difficult it is rather simple. In our village, we need only set the table. Invite all those who are in need of love and care. And then get ready for the love of Jesus to change our lives. May it be so. May it be so for all of us. Amen.